Oh, whenever you're ready there, Colin. Okay. Uh, uh, tonight, we welcome back Des Dalton, who was with us on Trustnet here last September, who gave us a fantastic talk on the guerrilla days in Ireland, the IRA flying columns and the war on the move. So be, because it was such a successful talk, we always wanted Des to come back. So we have him back tonight um, to discuss Margaret Buckley, who was a, a unique and is now somewhat forgotten um, individual from modern Irish history uh, and shouldn't be, that shouldn't be. So today, if you were to ask an average Irish person who the first female leader of a political party was, Manny would incorrectly state Mary Harney from the Progressive Democrats. Uh, Des is going to put that, set that uh, straight tonight. So just a bit of background information on Des. Des is a BA Honours in English and History from Carlow College. He's a Master's in Philosophy and Modern Irish History, at first from Trinity College in Dublin. And before I pass it over to him, uh, just a quick reminder of upcoming events. So this Saturday on Trastina, we have the book launch of United Irishmen Emigres of Ireland by Stephen McCracken and myself. And the next Tuesday, we have The Long View, Derry from Partition Civil Rights by Margot Shea. So you're all very welcome tonight. And I'll now pass you over to Des. Uh, thanks, thanks, Colm. And um, once again, again, uh, Garamago to uh, Trasna Natira for their very kind invitation to, to come and speak to you here tonight. Um, I'm delighted to be given an opportunity to, to speak about Margaret Buckley. Um, I think she's somebody that's a very much overlooked figure in Irish history, but actually an extraordinary figure and a ex very important person. Like we're, we're now in the, you know, in the, in the midst of the, of the decade of centenaries and we're looking back at that revolutionary period. And Margaret Buckley is, is a key figure. Um, her act activism and her involvement actually goes back, if you like, it spans from um, the, uh, the late 19th century, the late 1890s, right the way up to uh, the late 1950s and indeed her death in 1962, she remained uh, connected and an active member of the Republican movement. So, um, as I say, an extraordinary figure and um, a really, really interesting person, um, as, I, as I hope you will find and I hope I can, I can do her justice here tonight. Um, she was, uh, as I said, she was born in 1879. Um, she was uh, born Margaret uh, Golding um, in Cork City. Uh, her family actually, uh, I think she was born in the Winters Hill area of Cork. Her family actually, I think originally uh, came from uh, the Morn Abbey uh, area. Um, her father was uh, James Golding and uh, her mother was Ellen Nee Joyce. Her father had began uh, his working life as a labourer uh, he then became uh, a railway porter and ultimately became an inspector on the trains. Um, they were a Parnellite family, uh, very strongly nationalist. Um, and uh, Margaret um, talked about that, uh, about that influence on, on her growing up. So it was no surprise when, as um, in her late teens and early 20s, she was drawn to the... Uh, to the, to, the, to the cultural and if you like the uh, particularly the cultural revival that was then taking place um, if you like the cultural revolution and uh, she quickly threw herself into involvement in um, Conor na uh, she was involved in the um, national theatre movement and um, indeed Liam de Rochte, who was a member of the Cush of Gano of, of Conor na um, in his witness statement to the Bureau of Military History talks about her involvement um, in the running of plays with the National Theatre and um, the Cork um, Celtic uh, Literary Society. Um, and indeed in one play, I think she, she actually played the, the title role of um, Kathleen in Yeats's Kathleen, Kathleen Nehulahan. Um, she was also very early on um, a member of the, uh, a founder member indeed of uh, Ineary Nehairn, which was, if you like, a forerunner of coming Amon. Um, she started off, I think, as treasurer there uh, in, in that branch and uh, eventually, um, or assistant honorary secretary, actually, and eventually uh, she became his president. And um, 
Margaret Ward, in her book uh, on Unman Unmanageable Revolutionaries, described it as the most vigorous of the offshoots, um, describing it as um, almost a mirror image of the national organization and that it was very, very active. Um, many of its members, like Margaret, were drawn from a Parnellite, or indeed many of them were drawn from a Fenian background. And indeed, um, a former Cardinal Liam de Rushta, in his witness statement, a former um, 67 man, as they were described, uh, someone who had taken part in the 67 Rising, uh, Charles O'Connell, um, who was a native Irish speaker, uh, was also uh, involved in supporting the branch and helped them in running uh, Irish language classes and so on. Um, they were also very active in opposing the visit by the, the King of England, Edward VII, um, to Cork and uh, erected black flags and so on in Cork City. So she had very quickly made a name for herself in, in, in her involvement there um, in Cork. She was also a member of the Irish uh, Industrial Development Society. So as you can see, she had her, she had her, her finger in a lot of pies and she was, she, she was a very active organizer. And I think that, that was very quickly, uh, that talent was very quickly recognized in her. Um, she got married uh, relatively young in June 1906 to Patrick Buckley, who was a civil servant. Um, I wasn't able to discover a lot about Patrick. He, he doesn't seem to have been politically involved. Um, he worked at the revenue commissioners, uh, but with him, she moved to Glasnevin in Dublin, and indeed she was to remain there uh, for the rest of her life. Um, and it was in Dublin that she became involved in the trade union movement. And particularly, she was a founder member of the Irish Women Workers Union. And uh, she was very, very active there with them. She particularly working with responsibility for uh, the domestic workers union and representing um, women domestic, domestic workers. Um, for somebody that was coming in from outside of Dublin, um, there was a certain element of distrust. Uh, um, not much was known of her and so on, but she very, very quickly won over the confidence of those that she was working with. Uh, by her diligence, by her work, and she was very quickly recognised as a very, very effective trade unionist. Um, she worked on areas such as good, wa good wages, fair conditions, um, security of, of, um, of tenure and so on, and um, ensuring that, that, that people's, um, you know, basic work conditions were, were secure and were, and were protected. And um, as I say, she, her, her, her work as a trade unionist was quickly recognised and indeed she remained active as, as an active trade unionist right throughout um, her the rest of her adult life, right up until 1958, uh, before she actually retired as a, a, a full-time official with the um, Irish Women Workers Union. Um, coupled with that, she also continued her work with, uh, within the national movement. Um, she was, as I, as I said, she was a, she had, she was a founder member in Erie in Naheran. Um, but on top of that, then she joined Coming Amon, and but she was also a founder member of Sinn Féin. And again, her membership of Sinn Féin would be something that uh, she would remain a member of right, right until, un, un, until her death. Um, so coming to Dublin, um, she quickly threw herself in, in, into that work there. Um, she uh, was particularly active um, with coming them on. And um, in terms of 1916 rising, she was actually in Cork um, for the rising. So she didn't actually play uh, a, a, an active role in, in the rising itself. Um, she was caught up in the, in the confusion that, that, that engulfed the rest of the country at the time uh, due to the countermanding order and so on. So she, she escaped the, um, she escaped imprisonment in the aftermath of the rising, uh, but very quickly became part of the general reorganization um, of the Republican movement in the immediate aftermath. And um, again, based back in Dublin, uh, she played a key role in that. Um, during the Tan War, um, her particular uh, activities were in the area of um, uh, organization, as I say, and particularly within the Republican courts, um, she was invited on to the panel for the Dublin North City District of the Republican courts 
the, the panel of judges here were chaired by Kathleen Clark, um, who was the, the widow of Tom Clark, one of the signatories of the 1916 proclamation. And Kathleen, a formidable figure in her own right, um, a key member of Coming Amon, um, had helped reorganize, if you like, on the outside um, in the immediate aftermath of the rising, um, if you like, the treads of the national movement, whilst uh, you know the vast bulk of, its, of, of, of the leaders were in jail and, and the, 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 the um, if you like, the, um, the, the embryo movement um, that was taking shape post 1916, um, Kathleen was one of those that was key really in, in, in bringing all that together. So she chaired that panel. Um, Margaret was the treasurer and uh, Austin Stack, who was the minister for um, home affairs, uh, who had direct responsibility for the establishment of the, of the various Republican courts. Um, in his report in 1921, um, on the first year of the courts actually commended the Dublin North, uh, North City uh, Court Panel as one of the most effective in the country. In, in fact, I think even despite the activities and raids and so on and activities of the Black and Hands and Auxiliaries, they managed to, I, I, I think they managed to meet successfully, have court hearings uh, on every occasion. Uh, Jenny Wise Power was also uh, another judge in this district. Um, so that was a particularly noteworthy uh, role played by Margaret during the Tan War period. Uh, Frank Henderson, who was um, a member of the 2nd Battalion of the, the Dublin Brigade, also noted in his witness statement to the Bureau of Military History that um, Margaret made available the, the rooms, uh, rooms within the uh, IWWU headquarters uh, for uh, battalion and company um, staff meetings when they were finding it very, very difficult to meet and most of their regular haunts, if you like, were, were becoming too hot for them to use. Um, you know, Margaret actually made sure that they, that, that they had access to the Irish Women Workers Union uh, head office. So in all those kind of various uh, areas, um, Margaret seems to have had a hand and, and, and played a role. When the, with the passing of the treaty um, and the approach of civil war, Margaret um, uh, Buckley, as, as she was, uh, was, was now, um, she was now also a widow, her husband had died. Um, Margaret uh, rejected the treaty, um, along with the vast majority of, 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 of coming them on. Um, she would play a very, very um, active role, particularly um, in the Civil War, um, in, um, as a member of the uh, Women's Prisoners Defence League. Uh, working closely with people like Ma Gan and Char Charlotte Despard. And that was most of her work for the duration of 1922-23. Um, very dangerous work, and it was at a time when um, the Oriel Street gang, if you like, the, the CID um, of, the, of the Free State um, Intelligence Department were really at their worst within Dublin when they were effectively acting as a death squad and, and um, targeting people engaged in open political work, um, such as the Women's uh, Prisoners Defence League, um, Nafine Aaron and others that were involved in, in, in simply, you know, postering, leafleting and so on. There was many instances of, of, uh, of particularly young Nafina members who were actually literally taken from the streets and, uh, and, 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 and killed. So in that atmosphere, uh, Margaret was to the fore in her work, also as a, as a public speaker. She was a very effective public speaker. Uh, and um, she was uh, she was very much put put to work as if you like the public face of the of the, of the defence league. Um, the the actual if you like the the uh, the civil war formally if you like came to an end with the dump arms order in on April thirtieth of nineteen twenty three. But the reality was that um, by the IRA, but the reality was that that war really continued on for someone would argue it, 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 the last shots of it were fired in the 1940s. But for all intents and purposes, particularly within Dublin, but indeed in many other parts of the country, um, the raids, the arrests, the harassment and so on uh, continued unabated. And it was no different in, in Margaret's experience. And so she was arrested in um, 
she was arrested in uh, January, I think it was the 6th of January, 1923, um, and she found herself inside the walls of Mount Jai Prison. And based on her experience here in the jails, um, her, she wrote her famous book, The Jangle of the Keys, um, which was published in 1938. Um, it's one that's definitely due to be, you know, to be to be reissued and republished a new edition. It's an extremely rare. I, I'm privileged to have a copy myself. Uh, I know it's an extremely rare volume, and it's one that definitely should be sh should be shared with uh, you know with 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 a, with a new generation. It's a unique insight, if you like, in many respects. It's a, it's a unique prison journal, and it's a great addition, really, to the to the prison literature of the period, um, giving as it does the perspective of Republican prisoners at the time and women Republican prisoners and their experience and the picture it paints and it's one that's um, it's, it's a very bleak picture. Uh, the book itself is actually it's, it's an amazing read. It's a social document in many respects and kind of gives a great insight into uh, the mindset and the thinking um, of those Republican women of that time. And it's also a social commentary. Margaret in, in the book, for instance, comments on the efficacy of prisons as to whether or not prisons actually achieve what they set out to do in terms of correcting a social ill, um, in terms of acting as a deterrent for uh, those that were engaged in crime. And she comments on the, the poor condition of many of the, the ordinary women that are in there that are there for for various criminal offences, and she comments on the kind of the, the, the lives of desperation many of them lead, um, where there are cases where they would be released on a Saturday and they're back in again on a Monday. Um, and she talks about, you know, the, the, the wider issues of society and so on that need to address those kind of those, those, those kind of issues. So it's an amazing, it's an amazing document. In terms of documenting their experience there, again, um, there's parts of it that that are are, are 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 light in terms of you know showing that how the prisoners, uh, the Republican women there, um, constructed, if you like, their own kind of society in there, um, as is common to many Republic you know political prisoners, they can they, they they their own hierarchy and um, their own structures there. Like for instance, Margaret served I think on two occasions as the OC of coming among prisoners, um, in I think in Mount Joy and then latterly in Kilmainham. Um, she also recounts um, the brutality that were faced by the women. And in many cases, uh, in many respects, really, it was a war on women. Um, uh, there was a, a, a rank brutality uh, experience there um, on, on the women prisoners uh, by the Free State. Um, it, it would vary and would depend particularly often on the, the attitude taken by those at a, at a senior command level. Like for instance, in, in, in Mount Jai, she, she said that she found Paddy and O'Keefe um, to be quite amenable um, and, and, and they, 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 they felt a good deal with him. But in the North Dublin Union in particular and Kilmainham, she describes, for instance, the conditions in Kilmainham and in her preface, Mary McSweeney also comments on the conditions in Kilmainham as being particularly bad, particularly on the B wing where uh, Margaret Buckley and most of the other Republican women were held were absolutely atrocious and were commented on um, by a number of outside um, visiting committees. Um, it was a particularly stark time, and it was a time when um, those women, if you like, and in the previous slide, I referred to the women as the, being the women on the front line, and they were on the front line in many respects, um, facing all of this. And when, you know, um, appeals were made to people like W.T. Cosgrave and so on as to the treatment of the women. Or for instance, when Mary McSweeney was, I think, on her second hunger strike and, you know, it was looking likely that she could possibly die. Uh, for instance, and I remember reading a letter myself from the, um, the Archbishop of Dublin at the time in a letter that he wrote to Cosgrave asking that he would, um, that he would release Mary McSweeney and, and basically, uh, ameliorate the conditions of the of the women prisoners. Um, Cosgrave was completely un, un, unapologetic for his treatment, uh, the treatment that was meted out by, by, by the state to the, those Republican uh, women. And uh, he basically said that these people were, that they were um, basically, they had stepped outside the norms of society and that they had to be dealt with accordingly. And uh, it's it, 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 it quite brutal actually in his assessment of it. And that's reflected, as I said, in the reminiscences of people like Margaret Buckley, 
um, uh, Leanne Lane in her recent biography of, of Dorothy McCardle likewise describes, for instance, the riots that occurred in Mount jo in Kilmainham when there was a move made to move the women prisoners there to um, the North Dublin Union and effectively to isolate Mary McSweeney on, on, her, on her last hunger strike and the women refused to be taken. And basically a riot ensued over the course of about 12 hours and extreme violence was used by the Free Set Army on those women there. Uh, but the women refused to budge and ultimately Mary McSweeney was released and then only after that did, did, did the women move. But that was, if you like, the kind of um, atmosphere that pertained in there. Something else that, that comes across in, in Margaret's book is that um, there was a, even within the women themselves, there was a certain divide between those who felt that everything needed to be fought, every particular condition needed to be fought, and those like Margaret and Dorothy McCardle and others who felt that you, you, you chose your battles, that basically in some situations, rather than put, putting yourself through a state of even more extreme privation, you chose the particular issues that you would fight on and so on. And that, that's interesting as well. And again, it probably reflects um, a wider experience of political imprisonment. And, you know, it, it's something that would come across in, in other prison memoirs and indeed the experiences of other, other Republican prisoners, not only in that decade, but in, indeed in succeeding decades. Um, so from that point of view, as I say, it, it, it's, a, it's an amazing social document, an amazing political and historical document, and one hopefully at some stage um, that could possibly be uh, be reissued, hopefully maybe uh, for the for the centenary of the of the of the Civil War period. Um, following uh, her her imprisonment, she was released in um, I think at the beginning of 1924. Um, she immediately threw herself back into her work with her union and with Sinn Fein. And indeed, this is a period um, that I, again, I think is a period that requires and I think is worthy of much greater study. Um, she was, again, one of the key players, um, in, not initially, but uh, particularly post-1926 with, uh, within Sinn Féin. Um, she was there witness to the, um, the division um, that occurred with the departure of, of Eamon de Valera and the formation of Fianna Fáil. Um, Sinn Féin at that time, and it's, it's one of the interesting aspects of the post-Civil War period, um, I always think that the election result achieved by Sinn Féin actually in that August 1923 election is amazing when you consider the conditions under which it was fought. Um, you know, there was 12,000 Republican prisoners. Um, there was literally, I think there was only one newspaper, the, the name of it escapes me, I think it was in Mayo, there was only one local newspaper that was avowedly anti-treaty. All of the rest of the media and it was all print media, obviously, at that time, were uh, avowedly pro-treaty. Um, there was ongoing harassment of Republican activists on the streets, as I say, ongoing imprisonment. Um, de Valera, uh, President of Sinn Féin, was actually arrested while addressing um, an election rally on the eve of the election in, in, in Ennis in, in, in August of 1923. And despite all of that, Sinn Féin got a very, very creditable um, voter turn in that, in that election. Uh, I think in 1924, there was, I think Sinn Féin is something like a thousand coming throughout the country and was as well as being organized in Glasgow and uh, in London and indeed in other parts of, 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 uh, of Britain. However, within Sinn Féin at that point, there was, if you like, fault lines beginning to appear. Um, de Valera was making it very, very clear uh, and had done so in a number of interviews that uh, the issue of entering uh, Leinster House, the, uh, the Southern um, Irish Parliament, um, was not so much a matter of principle, but rather a matter of numbers in terms of if Sinn Féin would be in a position to take a majority position, and obviously regarding the taking of the oath, the oath of allegiance, which was required of all those who were taking their seats in the, in the, in the Leinster House Parliament. Um, <clears throat> That contrasted with people like J.J. O'Kelly, Brian O'Higgins, Margaret Buckley herself, um, who, Tom Plunkett, and other senior members of Sinn Féin, who obviously would see the oath um, as merely a byproduct of what was to them an illegitimate assembly. For them, the second all continued to represent the, uh, the legitimate parliament of the Irish Republic and the legitimate government. And indeed, De Valera continued to sit as president of that republic and claimed, and claimed that title. But as I say, the fault lines were there. People like De Valera, Lamas, um, Sean McEntee and others, and um, within the IRA, Frank Aiken, who was chief of staff, 
were definitely moving away from, if you like, that more fundamentalist Republican position. In November 1925, at the IRA's convention, the IRA withdrew its support from the second all uh, in what was quite a significant move, but also significantly, uh, they removed Frank Aiken as chief of staff, replacing him with Andy Cooney, and then laterally, um, Moss Toomey. Um, that, that was an interesting development itself, but it further isolated Sinn Féin and, and, and the second all, so that in the early, I think it was in January 1926, De Valera announced that um, he was going to seek uh, a special artist of Sinn Féin, in which he was going to seek um, the approval of Sinn Féin to take seats in Leinster House, provided that the oath did not need to be taken. Um, he actually lost that, um, that lost that vote. There had been a resolution actually had come forward from the Cahirzavin Common, just uh, actually to the previous year's Ardesh, which again had bound Sinn Féin to uh, its allegiance to the Second All and to rejecting uh, any recognition of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Free State Parliament. Um, However, uh, de Valera narrowly lost the vote on that and uh, he immediately resigned as president of Sinn Féin and within weeks uh, he and those who supported him had withdrawn and had, had established uh, Fianna Fáil. What was left in Sinn Féin at that stage, there was still a sizable organisation, uh, but funds were a major issue and would be a major issue for, for, for the Sinn Féin organisation and indeed in terms of through the courts as well. That's something I'll, I'll, I'll come to. Maybe I'll touch on maybe just a little bit, a little bit later. Um, and it would be something that Margaret Buckley herself would play a key role in. In this situation, as I say, post um, De Valera, Margaret Buckley was one of those thrown into positions of leadership, and you increasingly see her name connected with, uh, with, um, with Sinn Féin in terms of uh, public positions and so on as a public speaker. Um, Father Michael O'Flanagan, who was another one of the key uh, players at the time, along with Mary McSweeney, uh, O'Flanagan has established a Bureau of Speakers, um, of public speakers, their most effective public speakers, and Margaret Buckley was one of those. So she had very much became the public face of Sinn Féin at that time, or one of the public faces. Um, you would also see um, at that time as attempts were made to bring about a kind of a unity, and this is, and again, one of the striking elements um, or aspects of republicanism at this time was its fragmentation in that Sinn Féin, Cumann Amon um, and the IRA were at that point at, at quite separated. Cumann Amon and Sinn Féin were, were still at a much closer relationship um, and were tied still very much to the second all and their allegiance to the second all. Whereas the IRA at that point had broken away and was kind of hovering, if you like, between, between the two and also a parallel to a degree with Fianna Fáil. Um, there were a number of attempts made to, um, to, to to rectify that, and uh, for instance, call in a public that was set up as a kind of a platform within, or a, a, if you like, an umbrella under which the, 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 the three principal organizations of the Republican movement could, could continue to work together. And you would find increasingly uh, Margaret Buckley was sitting on those um, delegations that would come representing Sinn Féin in negotiations with the IRA and would come in them on and so on. Um, with the coming to power of Fianna Fáil in 1932, um, again, the pressure continued to mount on Sinn Féin and the other Republican organizations as well, um, particularly with the passing of the Military Pensions Act in 1934. There, were, there, there had been military pensions from 1924, but they were only applicable to those who had supported the treaty. De Valera recognized that, and he also recognized it as a means, uh, if, you, if you like, to consolidate his own position uh, by, if you like, bringing more and more people under the umbrella of the state. Um, with the passing of that act, it basically offered pensions to all people, regardless of what their position had been on the treaty, uh, who had taken part in the um, in the 1916-21 period, could apply for pensions. And in many cases, people were in dire financial straits. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, people felt the need to do so. Sinn Féin took a very rigid position on this and instructed her members not to apply under any circumstances for a pension, or indeed. Uh, people who applied or, or accepted um, state employment, uh, were, it, it, it was also uh, very much discouraged. Um, Cumann took a more flexible position on it, but as Margaret Ward pointed out, even those members of Cumann who due to financial pressures applied for a pension, 
many of them felt guilty and felt compromised having done so and just simply drifted away from active membership. Uh, the IRA also took a rigid position on it. Um, Margaret Buckley's own position on it was, um, according to her nephew, Seamus Goulding, uh, himself uh, was interned in the, in the Corrid during the 1940s as a, as a member of the IRA. Um, he said that her, her, her view on it was much more flexible and that she was willing to appreciate the very real situations that would face people in terms of, um, you know, providing for families and so on, and that she was willing to be, you know, much more flexible on that. But despite that, it created huge tensions within Sinn Féin. Um, for instance, um, Father Michael O'Flanagan um, had secured a position with the, um, the Department of Education, uh, where he, by, he was entrusted with the task of uh, drafting and um, bringing together uh, school books for, for primary school children. And um, there was moves by particularly led by Mary McSweeney to have him removed um, as president uh, on this. Now, th th this was twice uh, rejected. And on the second occasion, Mary McSweeney actually resigned from Sinn Féin uh, because, of, uh, because of this issue. So if you like, you can see the tensions that were there all the time uh, within Sinn Féin and uh, within the wider Republican movement uh, due to these various pulls. So that by uh, 1937, Sinn Féin was finding itself increasingly isolated, uh, even within the wider Republican family, if you like. Uh, because the 1934 uh, Cumann Amon had withdrawn its allegiance from the second all, um, you know, de declaring that they didn't feel that um, it was credible to continue to give allegiance to uh, what was seen as a, an increasingly irrelevant body um, and that it was a block on, on recruiting new members and so on. They continued to give allegiance to the declared republic, uh, but felt the second all no longer constituted, um, you know, a, a, a credible, if you like, um, political body claiming to be the government of, of, of the Irish Republic. This created, again, further tensions with Sinn Féin. And one of the, what's interesting at that point is that um, within Sinn Féin um, and within the wider Republican family, Sinn Féin was seen as increasingly obsolete and uh, numerous attempts to forge an alliance with the IRA, for instance, in many cases were, were rebuffed by the IRA and it, to a point where I think it was in 1935, Sinn Féin found it almost impossible to get a candidate to contest a by-election. It was the first by-election that they had contested since 1927. And two people, Count Plunkett was one, was approached and um, he was actually was instructed by the IRA to refuse, which, which, which he did. Um, and uh, J.J. Kelly also refused to contest. Um, or his son actually Mortimer uh, refused to contest that election. So that by 1937, um, uh, when Margaret Buckley became president of Sinn Féin, uh, in many respects, it, co it could be said that she was inheriting a poison chalice. What could be said in praise of Margaret, if you like, and, and in, 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 on the credit side of, of her record is that she was probably the safest pair of hands at that point. She was a person of great experience, both through her trade union activities and through her long experience within the Republican movement and its various organizations, as I said, stretching back at that stage, almost 40 years. Um, probably her greatest um, achievement at that time was probably just keeping that Sinn Féin organization together. Now, by that stage, Sinn Féin was really only active in Dublin, Cork, uh, it had a presence in Galway, Belfast, and uh, actually uh, Glasgow and London. Glasgow was actually a particularly active area. And indeed there was a, um, a, a particularly active common in Glasgow. And I, know, I, I think Stephen Kyle actually might be on here tonight. I know Stephen would be the, the expert on, 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 uh, on Sinn Féin and Republicanism in Glasgow. I know Stephen would, could say much more on that. But so that was basically the organization that Margaret Buckley was, was, was inheriting the leadership of at that point. Um, so it was, if you like a poison chalice that that she, that she inherited, but she 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 continued to keep things together. She kept, uh, if you like, a, a, a semblance of an organisation af afloat. The Ardeshna continued to be held. Um, the war years would have been particularly tough. Um, you know, there was internment, so there was a very, you know, vast waves of active Republicans were were interned in the Kara. Uh, there was the executions and hunger strikes and so on, and a very oppressive atmosphere. Uh, to operate in and Sinn Féin in that in, the, in that in that climate found it very very difficult to operate. 
At the same time, for instance, um, in 1938, with the the, 19, the, 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 the passing of the new constitution uh, in that 1937 referendum, um, Margaret took it on herself to speak on that constitution and was quite vocal um, in criticizing its, uh, its attitude, particularly towards women. Uh, again, reflecting that very progressive uh, element of her and um, her active trade unionism and so on. And she spoke on that, even though she was criticized by some uh, within Sinn Féin for doing so, because it was seen as almost a tacit recognition. But she, again, it was an issue that she, she, she felt necessary to speak on. Um, uh, she also spoke up on the uh, Conditions of Employment Act, which was passed like, in 1935, which again limited the ability of women to uh, attain employment um, and uh, a, a place in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the workforce. And again, Margaret was very, very vocal on that and again spoke out very strongly on it because again, she saw the effect that it was having on her own members as an active trade unionist. Um, so in those regards, she was somebody that did see the necessity of Sinn Féin having an attitude towards these wider social issues. But unfortunately, at that point, the Sinn Féin organization itself had shrunk to such a degree that even for her to get a platform on those issues was quite difficult. And by that stage, Sinn Féin itself did not have, um, did not even have its own newspaper. It, it depended very much on the goodwill of Van Fublacht um, and Saoirse Nehern, um to uh, to be giving an airing, and that was not always guaranteed. And in, in time, in fact, the times on Fublock took a quite hostile attitude to Sinn Fein, depending on what the then relations were between Sinn Fein and the IRA. Um, in the 1940s, uh, probably one of her most significant actions was to lead the what became the the the, the High Court challenge to the Sinn Fein funds, what became known as the Sinn Fein funds case, and this was a case where uh, monies which uh, had been the property of Sinn Féin had been, had been put in chancery, had been basically um, lodged uh, by the then treasurers of Sinn Féin in 1922, uh, just prior to the Civil War, uh, Eamon Duggan and uh, Jenny Wise Power, uh, both of whom actually were, were pro-treaty. And the monies had remained frozen there. Um, I think it was something in the region about £4,000 at that time, which by the 1940s, I think with interest and so on, it had grown to about £25,000. Um, when Jenny Wise Power died, her son had approached De Valera with a view to having the money, uh, having legislation passed to allow the money to be used to support those who had participated in the 1916-21 period, um, who had fallen on hard times to serve as a kind of comfort fund. Um, this was uh, also, uh, and, and the De Valera agreed to this on the provision that Sinn Féin would not receive any of the funds. Um, Michael of, Father Michael O'Flanagan was approached on this issue, even though at the, by this stage he, had, he, he was no longer a member of Sinn Féin, by uh, Charles Wise Power, and it was put to him, uh, O'Flanagan refused to commit to anything until he had spoken to Sinn Féin, and he contacted the Standing Committee. Um, when they became aware of this, then they, they, they were determined that this money was the property of Sinn Féin, and they took their case. It culminated, as I said, in a high court action and the Kingsmill uh, Moore judgment. And as I said, Margaret Buckley was instrumental in driving that case. Um, it was a it was a big leap for Sinn Féin to take because it meant rec obviously recognition of the um, of the, uh, the, the the Southern Irish courts and so on. But they felt that it was fundamental to not only in terms of the obviously the the, the monies that were to be you know were 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 to, were to be secured but also in framing Sinn Féin's legitimacy as, if you like, having unbroken continuity with, the, with, the, with, with that original Sinn Féin party. Uh, their victory was, was, a, was a peric one in many respects in that they, they failed to secure the, the funds. But significantly, uh, and it is quite significant, even if, if, if only in historical terms, Kingsmill Moore in his judgment actually um, recognized uh, Sinn Féin uh, as the legitimate successors of and, and having an unbroken continuity with that Sinn Féin. And actually in his judgment, he, he, um, he stated, and I quote, they appear to me perfectly sincere, believing not only in the righteousness, but also in the rightness of their claim. Moreover, they adduced considerable audience uh, evidence to show that they faithfully represented one approach to the Irish Republic, which was prevalent in the Sinn Féin of 1917-1922. The approach typified in Cahal Brua, amongst others, and which I have uh, termed transcendental. 
It would appear that all the required steps were taken to preserve the continuity of the organization and the present day Sinn Féin, this is 1948, is legally the same organization as that which was born in 1923. Um, at that point, um, Sinn Féin and the IRA were in a mode of, of reorganization, particularly the IRA. Um, it had barely survived the emergency period um, of 1939 to 45. Um, uh, to a point where the then Minister of Justice, Jerry Boland, was declaring in, in, in Leinster House that the IRA was dead and he, he had killed it. Um, so a, a, a big period of re-engagement and reorganisation was going on. Um, at that point, Sinn Féin and the IRA um, formally um, realigned. A new paper, the United Irishman, was launched. And um, in 1950, uh, Paddy McLogan, was um, nominated as president and Margaret Buckley uh, stepped aside to make way for him. And indeed, I, I remember uh, the late Rory O'Brady recounting that that 1950 Ardesh was his first Ardesh and was held in Nine Gardner Place, which was the then uh, headquarters of Sinn Féin. And he remembers Margaret Buckley delivering her presidential address. And uh, after the address, there was a round of applause and then uh, everybody retired for, for tea. Uh, in the room, and uh, I, 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 I always remember that it was just kind of just made it brought it alive uh, to me, um, you know, to, to, to hear that recounted um, uh, firsthand from somebody who was there. Um, following that, uh, Margaret remained as a vice president of Sinn Fein, and her last significant uh, action, if you like, she remained continued to work um, actively within Sinn Fein and also within her union, and um, was in 1957 when the entire Arcoria of Sinn Féin, with the exception of, 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 of Margaret, was interned. And actually she was the one left to deal with the, uh, to issue statements and so on, and was involved in, in helping to reorganize uh, in, the, in the aftermath of that internment. Um, so as you can see from really from the late 1890s, right up until the late 1950s, Margaret remained a very active Republican. Um, she, uh, she died in 1960, July 19, 1962, I think it's 24th of July. Um, and uh, she was buried uh, back in her native Cork in St. Vinbar Cemetery. Um, John Joe Rice, who had been uh, a stalwart Kerry Republican and elected as a TD actually in the, in, in the, late, in 19, in the 1957 election, uh, delivered the oration at her graveside. So as I've said, I think she's an, an amazing uh, woman, uh, an amazing uh, activist and Republican somebody who um, speaks to so many aspects of our history and of that revolutionary period and whose life, whose active life spans such a, a vast swathe of that period, really practically the, the, the first half of the 20th century. Um, it actually amazes me that a biography has not yet been written of Margaret Buckley. And I, I think she's somebody that is crying out very much to have her story told. Um, so again, I'd just like to thank Tristan Adira for giving me the opportunity to come here tonight to talk to you about Margaret. And uh, I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. So, um, Garmila Margaret. Thanks a million, Des. You've absolutely excelled yourself again tonight. Now, that was a great talk now on, on Margaret. It's a, what I found is, what was brilliant about it was, if you, if you, a lot, in the narrative being uh, released by uh, politics, Today, you, you'd nearly think that there was no Sinn Féin from 1923 up until the, the, the troubles in the, in the 1970s. But when you have somebody like Margaret Buckley, Buckley who, who, um, whose life, you know, she, she continued um, with the struggle all through the 1930s and 40s and even into the 1950s. And... Um, like it's 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 such a fascinating story, and like you, it's it, it's slightly annoying that you never really find much about Margaret Buckley. Like it's, she's not really discussed much, or uh, her life is not really delved into as much. But um, we had we have a, we've had a great response tonight um, for the talk. We've had uh, many people just saying fantastic and and and, and excellent. Uh, we have one. We have we have a few questions here now. We have. Um, one here from Marissa McGlinchey. Um, Des, you, you said that Margaret was a woman on the front line. This must have had a big, big impact on her private and personal life. Would you know much about that? Uh, 
that's an aspect um, that not a lot is known of. As I say, even I was saying, mentioning earlier that her, <clears throat> excuse me, that her husband, um, not much is known of her husband. Um, he seemed to be quite a private person, uh, private person and not involved in politics. The little that can be gleaned is, for instance, Unchin McKeown's book, um, The IRA in the Twilight Years, her nephew, uh, Seamus Goulding, is actually interviewed for that because Seamus himself was an IRA internee in the, in the 1940s. And Seamus, his father was a, a, a brother of, 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 of Margaret's. His, both his parents died when he was quite young. Um, I think his mother died and then his father went to work in Scotland. So effectively him and his brothers were, were, um, were, were, were left practically orphaned. And he was taken in by Margaret when he was about, I think he was about 11. So he grew up with Margaret. So what little can be gleaned I, that I could get was through his reminiscences of her. And it seemed to have been a very warm home. And she seemed to have been a very, he, he found her, he said she was a woman of great wit in repartee. He said it was a house that was lined with books. And I suppose it's probably no surprise when he himself, although he said actually in, in Nunchi McCone's book that she actually didn't actively encourage him to join the IRA, but he obviously grew up in a home where, you know, it was obviously a very political home. Um, but it obviously would have impacted on her. And um, it obviously did. Now, despite that, she seemed to have lived, I think because of the fact that she was a full-time official with the Irish Women Workers Union, I think that was probably her main source of income. And she seemed to have lived comfortably enough. Um, uh, I think Seamus concludes that, that that was one of the reasons that, if you like, he, he was fostered by her. But it did, um, she, she, had no, did she had no children of her own, but she, she, she did, um, she did provide a home for, for, for her nephew and uh, her entire life outside of that then seems to have been devoted to her activism, um, be it in Sinn Féin or through the trade union movement. Um, and uh, she, in many respects, she probably tip, typifies many of her generation that they were, they, they basically put their entire life on hold uh, to pursue these ideals that in her case had inspired her for, you know, over 60 years. Mm. Well, uh, we have one here from, from Liam. What would be your opinion on the general level of recognition that these women received at the time and indeed in current history? Uh, was this related to, the, to misogyny or the fact that Cumann Amman sided with the anti-treaty side during the civil war? I'd say there's a little bit of everything in that. I, I have to say there are times I hear re in, in, in recent years, I hear much talk about women being airbrushed out. And yes, there is absolutely a, a huge case to be made. That, I, that is the case. At the same time, I don't think it should be overstated because I know myself, and I, th this history has fascinated me from the time I was, you know, a teenager and, and, and even younger. And um, I was always aware and, and, and you know, aware of the role of coming on, aware of the role of, of many of these women. And, and many of those stories were being told. Um, I do think that that has greatly improved. And I think particularly with things like the Bureau of Military History and particularly the pension, um, the military pension uh, records coming out. I think there are stories there now that are emerging that were previously lost. Um, and I do think that, that that particularly female voices are being heard now in a way that they hadn't been. If you like all the big memoirs were written by the men um, and so on. But at the same time, there were stories coming forward. Um, Regarding, yeah, I think Liam's point is valid as well regarding the, 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 the women's attitude to the treaty. And I think that's reflected particularly in the new state. Like, for instance, and I, I referred to it earlier, that Margaret was a judge in the Republican courts. Um, after 1922, when the Republican courts were, were, were basically disbanded by the, by, the, by the new state, the first woman judge wasn't appointed, I think it was something like, the, I think it was the 1970s. Uh, women couldn't even serve on a jury until the early 1960s. So, you know, you, you talk about moving forward, the new state actually moved back on many of the advances that were made by, if you like, that that republic um, that existed, if you like, between 1916 and, 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 and 22. Um, and a, particularly the role played by the women in opposing the treaty, yes. I do think the new state were very, very suspicious of politically active, politically articulate women like Margaret Buckley, like Mary McSweeney, uh, like Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, Dorothy McArdle, all of these people. And um, that was even carried over by de Valera and is reflected in the 1937 constitution. So I think, yes, I think uh, it was difficult uh, from that point of view for, for those women to have their voices heard. Funnily enough, I think within republicanism, I think those women were acknowledged much more widely. But I think 
absolutely, I think in recent years, thankfully, I think a wider audience is being found now for their narrative and their narrative is, is being being told and their story is being, uh, you know, is, is, is being heard now in a way that it hasn't been. Uh, we have Stephen Coyle here who is watching. Another great talk, Des. I agree that it would be fantastic to see the Jangle of the Keys reissued. Uh, he said he's been trying to get a copy for years uh, without any success. So hopefully... Who, who would actually have the copyright for the book, I wonder? I don't know, because uh, it's... it's it, Well, it's 1938 was published. I know it was James Duffy were the publishers. Um, I'm not sure what the actual laws on that are. I know there's a period of time. Is it is it something like... I think it's something like um, 80 years or something like that. I think it, it, it expires, or maybe it's less. I, I wouldn't be an expert on that, but I think it's definitely something that, that, that could be explored. I, I, I would suspect that the copyright at this point might be... Um, you know, might now be open. Um, but definitely uh, failing that, definitely contact should be made with, uh, you know, some members of the, of, the, of, of the Golding family or whatever to, to see if it would be possible to have it reissued because I think it's, it's, you know, it's really a very valuable historical document. I think it's definitely one that a new generation should should have access to. And I agree with Stephen, it's extre- I, I was extremely lucky. I, I actually just happened to pick that up at a book fair in the Mansion House many years ago. And... Um, because I, I know that I, I, I was even talking to people in, I remember in, when I was in Trinity, uh, I remember a girl there, she was doing her, her master's on, on women political activists in the 1940s. And she was finding it extremely difficult, even within libraries, to, to access a copy of, of The Jangle of the Geese. We have a, another one here from Liam. How was Margaret treated by others within the party uh, when it was so unusual for a female to have such a position at that time? Um, well, I think the fact that she was elected president shows the respect and, 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 and she retained that position. Um, you know, I, I think that's actually one of the amazing things about that Sinn Féin organisation um, at that time. There's a stereotype, if you like, uh, particularly of, of that very traditional Republican, um, if you like, those really doctrinaire Republicans, people like be it Brian O'Higgins or whatever, is that they were very conservative and so on. And particularly that particular, if you like, rump of, of republicanism. But yet that Sinn Féin organization, the amount of very strong, powerful, articulate women that were there, Mary McSweeney foremost amongst them, um, uh, you know, Kathleen Brewer, um, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington for a period, and she's sided with Fianna Fáil. Uh, so there was quite strong women there, and Margaret was there amongst those, and and um you know, uh, they, they, they played quite a key role there. So I think, as I say, sometimes that stereotype of that subservient role of women, it wasn't, refl- I, I think that's actually in ways where, going back to what I was saying earlier, there's almost a dichotomy between the attitude of the state and the attitude within, we'll say, groups like Sinn Féin or within the wider Republican movement. Um, I think these were women that were, um, you know, more than confident and more than capable of standing up for themselves and having their voice heard there. So yeah, I think she was a person held with with with, uh, with great respect, and uh, even just looking at reports of her funeral, um, at the time she died, uh, that's reflected very much in the attendance and the representation there from a wide variety of, of society, not just even from from Republicans. So yeah, I think she was a woman of of of, of held in high regard. Um, we've got one here from Patrick Feather. Did. Did you have an opportunity to examine the pension files to see if Margaret applied and um, did she receive the maximum possible recognition for her service but during the... the I, I looked. The, uh, now, definitively, I can't say that she didn't apply. I couldn't find her. Now, that doesn't mean she didn't because I know there's a lot of it it's still to be digitised. So there's, there's a possibility her name doesn't come up at the moment. Um, but as I said, I can't definitively say that she didn't. Um, unfortunately, due to present circumstances, I can't travel to the military archives, uh, ideally. Um, but uh, I don't. I, I I suspect myself that she didn't. I suspect myself that she didn't. I know there were many who did, and there are many. It's one of the things with the pension files when you when you go on there. It's actually surprising sometimes the names that will come up, and I think it's unfair to judge because ultimately, you know, the economic circumstances that face people at at, at given times, it's perfectly understandable that people would have applied. Um, but as I say, I don't think Margaret, my, my sense is that she didn't, I haven't found evidence that she has, um, but I'm, as I say, my own sense is that I, I, I don't think she did. Uh, 
such a fascinating period like all that all the 1930s and 40s like as, as what i mentioned earlier like it's not generally known and like i definitely have to ask you to come back again in the future like maybe discuss the second all and like that's so many... yeah absolutely i i, I think it's a, it's a it's a hugely fascinating period and and you know I think one of the points in Brian Murphy in his book, um, Patrick Pierce, Lost Republican Ideal, and I think Fire Bell also says it in the, in the Secret Army, that again, the perception was that the brightest and the best went with De Valera, if you like, in 1926, and that what was left behind were these very doctrinaire, quite average, kind of middle-ranking kind of people, and that's not the case. These were people of great intellect, great ability. You can name them out, as we, we, we've named them there, you, you know, Dorothy McArdle, Margaret Buckley, um, uh, you know, people like Moss Toomey, uh, Patter O'Donnell, Frank Ryan. Uh, I mean, these, these, these were, the, you know, I think as a Patter, I think as Fire Bell puts it, these were people that would have graced any government and would have invigorated any, any national government. I mean, there were, there were people of massive ability. So I think, yeah, absolutely, Colm, I think it's a period that's fascinating and there's so many more layers of it to be, to be explored. Yeah. Definitely be asking you to come back for that nowadays. Okay, be a bit, we have uh, no more questions for you to ask uh, to, for, for me to ask you now. So um, should we wrap it up now? We're on an hour, we're on the hour now. So uh, on behalf of Trustnet here, thanks once again for Des uh, to Des for coming coming on to uh, give us another great talk. And um, we, we we have a few more talks coming up. I've, I've mentioned them already. So. Uh, Thanks once again, Des. We'll, we'll finish it up here now. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.